Germany and elsewhere, and she is the author of uh, the most important book ever written on Spanish masters, and uh, she was kind enough to accept our invitation. She arrived uh, late this afternoon from Madrid, and she is now going to uh, lecture us on Picasso and the old masters. It's a great honor for us to be welcoming her here. Let me tell you once more that you should switch your cell phones off during the talk. Please uh, excuse me for having said this, but thank you very much for switching your cell phones off. Good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to my friend, Dr. Nassan Olzer, for inviting me to be here uh, this evening in the series of lectures on Picasso. I didn't have a chance to see the exhibition yet. I will see it tomorrow, I think. Uh, because it's always a fantastic thing to be faced to the real works of uh, Picasso in front of you. Um, I'm not an expert or a specialist on Picasso. Um, the only thing in common with him from Picasso and me is that we were both Spanish and I understand his language very well. I'm not so sure if I understand his art. It's very provocative still in our 21st century and is sometimes very difficult. But um, uh, you have to, or in my case, I always approach artists in the same way from the very beginning of history, for example, for the paintings in the Altamira caves in Spain about 20,000 years ago, <coughs> and Picasso or the Chapman brothers in the present days. I think art is always the same, as human beings are always the same everywhere. <coughs> Picasso said, the artist is a vase of emotions that come from everywhere. It doesn't matter what it is from sky, earth, a piece of paper, a spider web. Because of that, one doesn't have to make distinctions among things. There is not an aristocratic difference in things for an artist. One should take things where you find them, except in your own works. I have a horror in copying myself, said Picasso, but I don't hesitate to take everything I want when they show me a portfolio full of old master drawings. He is a voracious, voracious artist. He takes everything that he is interested in and he makes it up in his mind. And sometimes one thinks, is that Picasso or is just an interpreter of all things, of all things and all things. But I think he is not just an interpreter. He mixes up things and everything comes new. <coughs> Malraux said in the conversations with Picasso, when I asked him, Picasso, how we could admire at the same time Poussin and Goya, he shrank his shoulders. I don't know. That's painting. Well, that I am in the same line of Picasso. From Altamira to Picasso, everything is the same, really the same. He also said something which is very interesting, because it situated him in a kind of universal space in which every artist is from the past to the present. He said, a painter should be free about his in instinct and break off, even at the cost of his life, the chain of rules. It's very interesting because Goya, in the 18th century, another Spanish painter, in 1793, he was asked to write a report on the teaching of art in the Academy of San Fernando. And it's a very important report by him in which he says, there are no rules in art. So they're almost the same words as Picasso years later, 200 years later. <coughs> 
We're going to go with the first slide. Picasso hated uh, illustrations. He used them also voraciously, but he didn't like them. I don't like them either because they always are. Uh, 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 they always uh, are. Um, they, they, you don't never see the real work of art, but you go downstairs, you see the, the works, and then you can make an understanding what he was doing. Um, this is a famous painting by him. It's the Femme Fleur of 1946, and is in fact a portrait of um, his lover at the time, François Gillot. Um, in this painting, François Gillot left uh, a text of explaining how Picasso was doing the, the painting. He said, he began to paint the portrait of me that has come to be called La Femme Fleur. I asked him if it would be bother him to have me watch him as he worked on it. By no means, he said. In fact, I'm sure it will help me, even though I don't need you to pose. And she went on explaining how Picasso had everything around him, the colors, the palettes, or using newspapers to mix the colors. And then he said, he stood in front of the canvas for three or four hours at a stretch. He made almost no superfluous gestures. I asked him if it didn't tire him to stand so long in one spot. He shook his head. No, he said, that's why pen painters live so long. While I work, I leave my body outside the door, the way Muslims take off their shoes before entering the mosque. Resting his chin on his fist, the other hand behind would stay there studying the painting without speaking for as long as an, as, as an hour. Then she goes on. There must be darkness everywhere except on the canvas, so that the painter becomes hypnotized by his own <coughs> work and paints almost as though he were in a trance. Well, Originally, says François Gillot, La Femme Fleur was a fairly realistic portrait of a seated woman. You can still see the underpainting of that, of that form beneath the final version. I think you can see here. Mm -hmm. Here you see a kind of shade. Hmm? Not very well in the slide, but you can see that there is something there underneath. In fact, there is um, a print by Picasso. Mm. Sorry. That shows probably what was this idea of Francois Gillot, the first idea of Francois Gillot. Is Francois here? She's sitting on an armchair. She's not full length uh, portrait, but probably was like that. Then she says, she goes on explaining. After working a while, he said, no, it's just not your style. A realistic portrait wouldn't represent you at all. Then he tried to do the taburet, the, the, the chair in another rhythm. I don't see you seated, he said. You are not at all the passive type. And he went on and on cutting off and redoing the portrait until we got the femme fleur as it is today. But in fact, this portrait here, uh, as also the femme fleur, comes from, from a painting by Lukas Kranach, the German artist of the 15th century. It's a very important painting in Berlin. And you can see in the center, the woman sitting. It is a bad shabe in the, in the bath. The woman uh, on, on her knees in front of her and a big tree behind. This Picasso changes into that in another woodcut of the time in which the woman is seated in the center. Mm. So sorry. The woman is sitting in the center and then you can see this palm tree, this kind of uh, tree behind her. So he's moving towards in the end, this kind of portrait. That is not copying the past. As Apollinar said, 
Apollinaire said, the French poet who was a friend of Picasso in the early uh, years of the 19th century, he said, bad poets copy, good poets steal. That's what Picasso did. In fact, he, is, he was stealing and robbing things to use them in his own way. Let's leave for a while Fra Francois Gillot, and then we go to the next thing from this fan flower. We go to the next painting to see how Picasso was. This was Picasso in 1895, when he was studying <coughs> in Barcelona with his, with his father. <coughs> as you know, was the director of the Academy of, um, of Fine Arts. And we can, we can say that Picasso was an old master when he was a young person, a very young man here. This is a famous painting called Science and Charity. It's very much into the ideas for paintings at that time, but also the technique and the disposition of the scene and the realism of the figures are exactly in, in the paintings of the end of the 19th century in Spain. You can see already that he is a great artist, that the mood and the sentiments are all there. That, as he also said, I'm not quoting directly, but as he also said, pains come, painting comes from a lot of pain. In, in the people, in humanity. So you can see here the death of the mother, the doctor next to her, and the little child who doesn't know what is happening. Hmm? He was really, as you know, trained by his father <coughs> in the most incredible way. This is a torso of also about a little bit before, 93, 94, <coughs> which is in the Musée Picasso. It's a torso of after a plaster from antiquity, and you can see how he was able to draw already when he was a little boy. But Picasso jumps quickly from this um, recollection of antiquity, which, which was the training in the, in the academies at the time. He goes to Paris on a first trip, and he immediately gets the ideas of how to change science and charity into something else. Here we have one of the sub typical subjects of the time. It's a woman uh, drinking in a kind of cafe. And we can see behind this Gauguin on the French painters of the, of the end of the 19th century. And also, in another it's completely different style, coming more from the Ga, this blue room, which is also uh, of the first trip of Picasso in, um, in, in Paris. <coughs> After these uh, excursions abroad, he comes to Madrid. He comes to study in the Royal Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, who was a very prestigious place um, throughout uh, the life of the Academy since the 18th century. He was there, as you know, he was expelled from the Academy, sent away from the Academy, because he went with a group of his colleagues to Toledo and he copied the big painting by Greco, the um, entomb entombment of the Count of Orgas. I don't have a reproduction here, but it's a very incredible art altarpiece with all these faces, portraits of the 16th century Spanish people. And what Picasso did was to change the faces of these knights of the 17th century and saints into the faces and portraits of the teachers of the Academy of San Fernando and his own friends. So when they sh he showed that, he was sent off the academy, but he was already revolting the past, using the paintings of the past in a different way, very different from uh, his colleagues. In any case, if the academy, with his rules, not following Goya advice, uh, sent him away, Picasso had the Prado in, in Madrid, and the Prado was always an incredible museum. Goya. <coughs> had written a little autobiography almost at the end of his life for the first Prado catalogue. 
and in it, he said, is a very good idea that they are opening this museum with the big collection of paintings from the Royal Collection, because that will teach the future students, because I learned all I know from the best examples of paintings and of the best artists in Italy and in Spain. So Picasso had a good collection in front of him to study. He says, the 3rd of November 1897, from Madrid, in a letter to one of his friends in Barcelona, the Museum of Paintings is great. Velázquez, first class. El Greco, magnificent heads. Murillo is not very convincing. Titian has a good Madonna. Ten years, very good small paintings of drunker people, drunken people. And everywhere there are Madrilenian girls that not even Turkish girls are better. <laughs> that I don't know if he had a chance, a chance to have met already Turkish girls, but probably he was thinking about the anger uh, paintings of uh, the um, harems or uh, you know other 19th century French paintings of that kind. But it's very, very sort of funny. And one of his friends, an Argentinian uh, painter, Fran Fran Francisco Benare Benareggi, says in one of his letters, I went to Madrid with Picasso. We went to the Prado every day. It was a moment of rebellion against the painting of history. Picasso and I copied El Greco, and people were scandalized. Greco was considered a traitor. And that's what they copied. But you have to think in one, one thing. It was the first exhibition of Greco ever in Madrid, in the Prado Museum in 1900. So that's what he saw. They had a chance to see many paintings that were not just always in exhibition. We go ahead. That takes a little bit. And we have here a self-portrait about that time in which he is under one of his masks. He's presenting himself as an 18th century painter, probably thinking of Goya. In this museum, where he copied Greco, he copied also paintings like this one by Velázquez. This is on the left, you have the portrait of Philip IV by Velázquez in the Prado, and on the right you have the copy of uh, Picasso, which is in the Museo Picasso in Barcelona. Already there is a big change between the copy and the original painting. You can see that she, he had elongated the face, he had changed the expression of the eyes, making him, the king, even more sad and um, lost as he was in the last years of his of his life so he's already changing the past this Greco that they loved you have here an example this is the knight with a hand on his chest chest which is one of the most famous portraits of Greco in the Prado Museum and, 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 and everywhere comes from the Royal Collection. And it, it is a coincidence between the copies of Greco with the little books of notes by Picasso in he, for example, scramble, is, is, is scribes, uh, Greco, Velázquez, inspire me, or he says, yo Greco, me Greco. I Greco. Hmm? It's uh, interesting, this incredible uh, obsession with a painter that was not considered by anyone at the time. Only one, only one French artist was really ravished by Greco words, Frédéric Astruc, a friend of Manet, but that was very, uh, nobody knew about that, only Astruc knew that he liked Greco, but Picasso is different. He goes around making really Paintings after Greco. You have a painting of that time, 1899, which is also in the Museo Picasso, which is a head, a kind of um, more than a portrait, a study, a study which is obviously based on the knight with the hand of his chest. And we'll come back to this at the very end of the lecture. But he is not only a copist or a very... Mm, 
loyal interpreter of the past. He does quite quickly. A painting like this one, a self-portrait in 1901, which you have the Greco intensity, the cold colors, the lines of contours, and the psychology of the face. And here I will show you sort of quickly more compositions which are really based on El Greco. Mm. Here on the right you have the big drawing called Mad Men, which is also in 1901. <coughs> and on the left you have a painting by Greco, or Saint John the Baptist, and you can see that the elongation of the figure, the interpretation of the hair, the intensity of the strange look, the legs, for example, the feet, the way they are presented, they are all coming from Greco, but already is Picasso, it's not anymore a Greco. A painting like the very famous boy with a horse or leading a horse in the Hermitage, it really comes from another painting by Greco, which is, was, and is in a very um, a difficult place to get access. It's a small chapel of a private palace in Toledo, and uh, it was exhibited in the exhibition I told you. So that is probably where he saw this painting, uh, the white horse, the beauty of the idea of the young boy, even if it mixes many more things, obviously, but uh, it comes from that, you know. And I will show you another few examples of his um, devotion for a Greco. Here you have a painting by 1902 on the right, which is the Two Sisters, which in fact, as Picasso uh, explains himself, he intended to paint um, a prostitute, the one on the right, coming to visit his sister, who is a nun in a convent. Mm? But then he changes that subject into more deep, deeply, a more deeply interpretation of the meeting of the two women. Like on the left, you have a painting by Greco of the um, subject of uh, the Virgin Mary visiting her cousin Elizabeth and telling her that she's pregnant. And this is what Picasso reassumes this subject in a different context and at a different time. But he's not always copying only one thing, and we will see that in the rest of the lecture. You can see in the next, in the next uh, slide that Greco is in the tonality and in the colors, but the emotion and the intensity of the closeness <coughs> of the two figures could have been taken, by, taken from something else, like this Romanesque painting of uh, a church in Catalonia, which uh, has these incredible uh, figures got together, I mean, with the heads really close, and the position of the heads and the bodies of Picasso is more of the intensity and, express, and expression of a medieval painting. <coughs> he goes with the love for El Greco to the end of his life. At the very end, when he... Here we have a painting by which was at the time was considered to be by Greco. Now they think it's by an Italian artist, uh, but there is a big debate about who was the author of this. But the, but the painting is in every book uh, a Greco painting. And you can see that this type of portrait, the veil on the head of the woman, the intensity of the look is very similar to. Uh, portrait of Jacqueline, 1955, the Jacqueline in black, which also the black has um, a nexus, uh, is, is, um, is close to Spanish paintings. And as you know, Picasso said that uh, the black is the best color of all, and only Velázquez could use, could use blacks in a perfect way. And you can see here a mixture of the intensity of the face of uh, El Greco and the blacks of Velázquez all together. Another painting by uh, Greco, a portrait of an artist, in fact, the son of El Greco, is reinterpreted in a late style of Picasso. 
in a very famous painting of 1950 <coughs> in Lucerne in, in Switzerland. <coughs> you can see that this is the style in which he <coughs> makes many paintings is previous to his studies of Las Meninas, in which these knights or ladies uh, dressed in clothes of the 17th century are very common. Velázquez is a more difficult question. Velázquez is always more difficult. And for a painter to interpret Velázquez uh, is quite something. Manet did it. Picasso tried. Uh, but you can see that even in things, in paintings, that, ha that the connection has not been done, you can see that he copied one thing. Here you have on the left a Velázquez painting called the Buffon Calabacillas is also in the Prado Museum. So uh, he could have seen it. By the way, we have in the Prado the books, the register books with the signature of Picasso when he came to copy. It's sort of very moving. But uh, here you can see this strange position, which is really uh, uh, um, something that Velázquez found a means of expression, expression that it is very unique and singular, though um, Velázquez himself took the position probably from a print by Dürer, which I don't have here, but it's, a, it's not a very well famous print by Dürer, but it's probably is the same sort of funny way of putting the legs. Um, to make the figure on the floor seen from above and with the face up. That is a similar thing, a similar position that it is quite obvious that Picasso saw in the museum and was interested in it. And he used that heavily to the end of his life in very different type of compositions. Like this one, which is from a Barcelona period in 1903, just before he went to Paris for, for good. And this, in a 1950 a portrait. And this again is a bit before. But again, you have in a naked woman the interpretation of the legs. He found it interesting and he got it. Sometimes he just is not interested in the artist in itself or in a painting. He's interested in one thing about something, about a painting. And that's also very interesting in him. And we can see that he was very honest when he comments that you can take, or the artist can take from everywhere, from what he needs, from whatever source it is uh, important. <coughs> With Las Meninas, he was very interested. I mean, I don't know if I can find my paper, but I can quote by heart. Las Meninas is one of the paintings that he really liked. It's a big masterpiece in the Prado collection, and he says that the very first, the very first time he saw the painting in the Prado, he was shocked by this composition, remained in his mind, in his eyes, he said, and he was sure at that moment that he was going to use it later on, that he had to use it in his life, as we will see at the end of his life. It's an incredible painting in the relation of the space and the figure, in the naturalism of the composition, in the strange distribution of the princes and the servants, the dwarfs and the dogs. And so any painter from any time after Velázquez was interested in this composition. There is a little sketch of Picasso at the time, at the time when he was in Madrid. You can see there on the corner a very quick sketch of the central figure of the little Infanta Margarita, and on the left, the lady in waiting called uh, Maria Sarmiento. Also interested, interesting on the right is the figure of, um, of a knight, is a man, and you can only see a little bit of a scribble of the horse. It's probably one of the portraits that we have of uh, Philip IV. Uh, so he was in the Prado 
very interested in what he was seeing. Now we are going to go to another drawing of this time. It's a drawing in the Museo Picasso in the Barcelona, and it's dating 1901-1902. At that moment, that very year, there was an exhibition in Madrid, the first retrospective exhibition of Goya, and it was done by the Ministry of Public um, Education, and it had many paintings by Goya, and some of them that they had never been seen in private collections. This drawing by Picasso, which is of, of a man sort of killing, a strangle a woman, and look at the face of the woman here, Ow. you know, facing up with the mouth open, and I can roll the, the mouse, with the, with the mouth open up, and see this painting by Goya that uh, at the time of Picasso had never been seen before. It's a very, it's a small painting of part of a series of, of works that he did in 1800, all of very violent scenes. They're still in the collection of the very same uh, uh, family that uh, had the paintings in 1800, the Marques de la Romana, um, uh, aristocrat. You can see here, is a, these are three paintings on scenes of bandits and what they do is to kill the men and rape and kill the women afterwards. It's a very violent scene that since 1900 a lot of um, text, texts had been written on, on it, on Goya and why he used this composition, strange composition, but it is obvious that Goya saw it and was interested in this kind of violence and aggressivity, which in Goya is mixed with love, obviously. And the intensity of the aggression, or aggression, aggression of the male, which here you are still, or we are still in the border of the murder of the man, of the, mon of the monster killing the woman, but here in this one, which is coming next. You have the love is not anymore is not anymore going to kill her. He loves her. So there is a way of using Goya, always very interesting in Picasso throughout his life. He had a great admiration for him, as you can read in the texts uh, addressed to Goya uh, by by Picasso. It's in fact with Goya that we are going to start the years of Picasso in Paris. He goes to Paris forever in 1904, and there he really opens up to everything. But in fact, I wanted to start still with Goya. This is a painting that was a kind of icon in France throughout the 19th century. It's two mahas on a balcony. It's a painting that Goya did in 1812, around the time of the Napoleonic War. And he kept, it, he kept the painting for himself and was sold after the death of Goya. It went to France, was exhibited in the Galerie Louis-Philippe, was reinterpreted in a free way by Manet, and it was, in fact, a painting admired in France very much. We can see that Goya, too, liked that painting. There is a photograph in 1904 in the Atelier de Bateau Lavoir, the first atelier of Picasso in Paris, in which he does this photograph of Fernand Olivier on the left and Benedetta Canas on the right. And they are both dressed as Spanish majas and leaning on a balcony, sort of trying to imitate that world of Goya, to rein make a reinterpretation of that. But Picasso goes further, and I think that when he does a painting like the portrait of Benedetta Canals in itself, it goes on mixing and using in this portrait the idea of the two majas of Goya. And also, 
in a later painter painting, um, like the portrait of Olga Koklova, uh, his first wife, the Russian dancer. Uh, even with the differences that there are in this portrait and the classical turn that he gets in this time, but uh, still in mind he has this idea. Here the balcony is behind her, is projecting her. She's not hiding behind the balcony, but that's the kind of thing that Picasso does when he's using the old masters. <coughs> In um, Paris, well, here we have also the Maha. I was just going to tell you that also in Paris, he's thinking about one of the paintings which were also a symbol of Goya. It was very recently been shown in the Prado Museum after 100 years of hiding the painting in the Academy of Fine Arts. So he could have seen it either uh, directly or in reproduction. And after this painting <coughs> comes this beautiful watercolor of Fernand Olivier, probably painted in Gosol or is still in Paris. Gosol is a little village where Picasso goes uh, with Fernand Olivier. So, but he is thinking of the Maha. The idea of the clothes of the bath clothes with this kind of shape on the front and also the hands up behind her head are obviously taken for this strange idea of Goya when he depicts the bed of the woman. <coughs> and up to the end of his life, Again in the 1950s, you have this idea of the woman lying down here on the beach with the hands up, collecting in his mind the beautiful um, uh, composition of Goya. But in fact, Paris is the place in which Picasso can really study or see as many possible things that he wants. The, the big love after the Spanish painters of the past, after Greco and Velázquez, the big love of Picasso at that time is Angre. The, the French painter, the neoclassical painter of the um, early 19th, 19th century. And he mixes styles. Picasso again is using the blue period that comes from the Spanish years, previous years, the idea of the slender figures, elongated figures taken from Greco, but using in fact compositions of Angre as the basic um, uh, inspiration for these works. You have here the figure of Octavio with Livia and Augusta, and Octavia, sorry, Augustus, Octavio, Livia and Octavia reading the Enaid in which uh, this little girl is based, this incredible dignified figure, um, essential already, of the new Picasso, which is going towards uh, Cubism. But even at the end of his life, a portrait of Jacqueline, like this one, has still a depth in the composition, in the way he's using the profile and the, and the hieratism, the strictness of the figure is still using the ideas of Angre. Angre, as I was saying, is the next move of Picasso as getting things. Um, the lecture uh, seems that everything he does comes from somebody else. But in fact, I mean, he did, or they are, they are, now we know that there are about 50,000 things of the hands of Picasso, either drawings of prints or paintings, sculptures and everything. So is this is very selective, 
because he was really a free painter, an absolutely free artist. But it's a selection which is just taking these comparisons that made him look like somebody who was always looking at other artists to steal things or use things from others. It's in fact more more deeply and more complicated, this relationship of Picasso with all masters. Somebody has said that this relation of Picasso and all masters came from his life as a child. The opposition or this controversy with his father, who was an artist too, was trying the little child to copy him, to copy him and at the same time revolt against the father, which is what he is constantly doing later on in his life with the old masters, copying them or interpreting them, and at the same time there is a contra con contra controversy, there is a confrontation of Picasso with all of them. He wants to be him, and he says that very clearly in all of his uh, words. Another composition which is uh, an icon for Picasso is this uh, Venus of Angre, which he makes, interpret in 1906 in a series of paintings, which I will pass as quick as the machine wants me to <laughs> do it. And he, he changed the idea of the woman combing her hair naked and later on dressed too. And it's also a subject that goes to the end of his life, which is also in the French painters of the 19th century, end of the 19th century, not only in Angre, but from him is the idea of Angre that comes uh, for, for these paintings. You can see the, the swift in style from a more realistic or yeah, sort of traditional way of interpreting the figure towards this abstraction that little by little goes towards, towards cubism. And from the Grand Odalisque we have also a cubistic interpretation, which is one of the most interesting ones. It's 1907-08, and it is related, of course, to the Demoiselle d'Avignon, and we can see that women in real, in the flesh, or women in the past, are the same kind of thing in Picasso's imagination. We saw him using Greco for early portraits, but also Angre is in the base of paintings like the portrait of Gertrude Stein. Look at the hands, especially also the position or the light in the face and the strong presence of this woman in the space. You can see a relation that has been done many times, which is between Louis-François Bertin, the, pain, the, the painting by Angre, and his first um, uh, uh, marchand, uh, Gertrude Stein. But also, at the end of his life, Angre comes as a kind of path to follow for beauty and for interesting attitudes of figures. You have the Angre portrait, and you have a portrait of Dora Mar with the mirror in the back, the hand, the position, the colors, of the lighting, but in a different mood already in 1950. <laughs> also, the odalisk with a slave here, playing the kind of um, lute. You have it in Picasso, a very late painting of Picasso, almost a kind of copy, in this case, of the painting by um, Angre. But it's not the only one. I will show you not all of the painters and, and, and works that he copied, but a few of them, because they are very varied. And he goes from one to the other, really always getting and reflecting and reacting to what the past was uh, telling him. But he didn't copy absolutely everything. His ideas were sort of narrow. He copied Greco and Velázquez, Angre, and very few artists, in fact. And we have here, after the Cubistic period, his mind sort of opens. He's looking for something else. He's looking for another way of expression. And we have the happy family of Lenin, reinterpreted in a kind of Matisse, Matissean style uh, or 
also punt, puntilla puntillistic, I don't know if that is the word in English, but the puntillism of the French movement in this one here, a very beautiful one. Manet will be another source of inspiration for Picasso. From Manet, he gets in the first instance the Olympia, which is very similar to the Naked Maha by Goya. Uh, they say that Olympia is the first modern painting of history, but the same can be said of the Maha by Goya, which is not anymore a Venus, it's just a naked woman. And from Manet he gets this, the lovers, the Dejeuner sur l'herbe, for example, as we will see later on. You have here the lovers, look at the woman, the dress, the bouquet of flowers, the chairs long at the back, the man dressed in black behind her. And it's easy to see that this scene is, uh, in 1919, a reinterpretation of Manet's Nana. Uh, should be here? Yeah. Which is now in Hamburg. It was difficult for him to have seen it. But Nana, as you probably know, was a painting of a scandal that Manet show, because they didn't allow him to show it uh, somewhere else, in the salon, he show it in a vitrine of a shop. So a painting that was really known, and there, it was many caricatures of, of it too, and reproduction, so Picasso could have seen it in reproduction. This is a period, after the cubistic period, in which we see Picasso going everywhere. So, in my opinion, trying to find a new path, trying to study new things for the next movement, from the next capital style. And we have it, we have Lenin and the old masters, we have Manet, we have Renoir and Cézanne. And from Cézanne is interested, because, interesting because you have here the one of the series of um, bathers, of naked uh, women or men near a river of 18, around 1885. This one is the single figure, which is in the Philadelphia Museum. Sorry. And you have the, the same idea in Picasso, coming sure for, from uh, these um, uh, bathing figures of, um, I thought it was, sort of moving the light. Well, you have here, since 1921, a series of studies, there are many, in which the main idea is the naked men or naked man, frontal, going back to this idea of the frontal naked uh, person, man in this case, in which he changes. You can see that in Cézanne, the idea was the revolution or the revolt against the heroic nudes of the past. But in Picasso, and you, have, you, you see the fragility of this man, is not a hero. These very thin arms, funny legs, the sadness of his face. But in Picasso we have the contrary. He's studying Cézanne, but he doesn't see why you cannot use this heroic figure. And in fact, he's mixing again a few things. Cézanne with the idea of the frontal naked figure, but also the kuroi of the Greek um, sculptures of the 6th century before Christ. And you can see that in the hands especially, the stocky figures, the frontality, and the hands close of the Greek athletes of the past. He's using that figure in one of the main capital works of the time in which the classical period, period of uh, Picasso starts, is the Flute of Pan of 1923 in which he's using the naked figure on the left and a young boy playing the flute on the right. In that, on the left, we can see the idea of the Apollo, of the Greeks, the idea of Cézanne, the idea of the Greeks, the Kuroi, especially, the young athletes of the Greek sculpture, but on the right, we have a more sophisticated figure. It's a young boy playing the flute. 
with a specially interesting position of the legs, very expressive. And if we go to the previous uh, drawings for this composition, which I don't have here, you have in Zerbos, all of them. The man is sitting normally, this young boy is sitting with the legs wide open in a very natural, relaxed position. But here he's sort of tense, has a tension, which when I saw it, I said, this has to come from antiquity. In fact, there is a position that you find in the Greek sculpture, but more or less not like this. And I went to one of the loves, the new loves of Picasso in this period, and a love for the rest of his life, which is Poussin. Uh, Poussin is going to be the next move of Picasso, the next artist that is going to devour that we're going to study, he's going to, he's going to rape in a way. We have here one of the works, of very important works by uh, Poussin at the Louvre, is, is, is uh, the central detail of the composition of Orpheus and Euridice. And you have Orpheus, another musician, on the right, and you see the legs, how they are in this tension that Picasso makes even more expressive. Picasso speaks about this painting. In one of his quotations, he says, look at the Orfeo by Poussin. Even every single leaf in the painting, from the trees, every single little herb or leaf, is part of the narrative, narrates something. That I find very interesting because, as you know, everybody says, and even Picasso himself, said that, that the subject in a composition is not important, that that's not the main thing of a painting. But in fact, when he had, when he goes to admire the painting, paintings of an artist like Picasso, he exactly points that everything, every single leaf in the painting tells the story, is there to help us to understand what is happening. Here what is happening is that while Orfeo is singing, a serpent is arriving to Euridice and poisons her and she dies. So I think that in the compositions of Picasso, there is always a subject, always a theme. Um, sometimes maybe we cannot understand exactly what he wants because it's not as in the paintings of the past, um, a fixed iconography, a subject that everybody recognizes. He uses the expression to his own iconography, to his own life, to his own interests. But in fact, I think there is a subject. Going to his uh, admiration or devotion for Poussin, we have another painting of this period. This is slightly earlier than, than the flute of Pan, the flutes of Pan, and is the three women at the fountain. And in fact, this beautiful classical painting that comes from the period in which he goes to Italy with the Diaghilev uh, Russian ballets, is again taken, and this has already been stressed, from a composition by P Poussin at the Louvre, which is the Rebecca and Eliezer. Um, and you can see on the right, also on the left, there is uh, women at the fountain taking water and especially the group on the right of the three women on the right is very um, is similar to the Picasso painting, but even more similar is when he studies this painting, which is the Narcissus at the fountain, a beautiful Poussin also at the Louvre, a very famous painting by him in which the study of uh, the naked man is the central theme of the painting. And this, I will do a little excursion, but Poussin is a French painter that went to Italy and stayed there for the rest of his life. And the arrival to Rome makes the same reaction in every artist that since the past goes to Rome, from Raphael to Michelangelo, to from Michelangelo to Annibale Carracci, Poussin, and then later on, even for Goya and Ingres and David, 
and Picasso himself, the reaction to the monumentality and the beauty of the naked body in Rome makes them use that intensely in, his own, in their own paintings. You have here this work by Poussin, which is used again in this admiration for the classical past in the beautiful painting, photograph is not very good, of the family at the border of the sea, which is also of this classical period in 1922. But as you know, and again we go to the end of his life, Picasso still uses Poussin heavily like, for example, in the, in the rape of the Sabine women, which he does later on in 62, or the Bacchanal uh, by Poussin, which is also reinterpreted by him in, in paintings, which are a mixture of art and caricature, I think. <coughs> but Picasso is not an art historian. He is very funny about that when um, they tell him that François Chilot has written a, a book on him and the relation with him and that she um, makes Picasso, she quotes or uh, makes a yeah, quotation of Picasso about all masters. And he says, oh, yeah, I know, I, I heard, because he didn't read the book, I heard that she says that uh, she put a lot of words in my mouth about all masters. She said, as, is I, as if I were an art critic, or maybe better, an academician of the Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, the one that they expelled him when he was very young. So he was not an art historian. And an artist is never an art historian, because they have a very clear, selected, individual and singular view of things. We, art historians, have to be completely neutral and objective, but artists don't have to be like that. They actually reject that point of view. They just take what they, what they need from art. They see, actually, not just take, they see only what they are interested in, and they don't see the rest. Anyway. In this period, and I will show you other works before we arrive to the final years, we have again the use of Goya, like in this portrait of pa Paolo in, uh, in 1923, which is similar to the gentleness, the candor, the innocence that he sees in the portraits of children by Goya. But it not only is interested in the, as we have seen, in the Goya, in the most gentle and beautiful Goya. But for example, we have here a painting at the Louvre. This is Goya, and it's one of the still lives of Goya with a head of, um, of a um, cow and the ribs also on the right side. The head is the interesting part here, which Picasso again takes in a series of drawings, carnet, carnet sketches and paintings like this one. He's using this kind of terrible um, view of death that Goya did in his own paintings. This view of death is actually starting in this period of um, around 25, 30s, towards the period of the Second World War. I don't know if, in, I suppose they have studied this, but it is a kind of very pessimistic tendency that appears in his works. And, for example, in around 1930, 1932, he begins to study this, this incredible painting of the crucifixion by Grunewald. It's the altar of Isenheim, which is in the museum in Colmar, <coughs> and is a 15th century artist of an incredible expressionistic um, appearance in everything he did. And Picasso is incredibly taken by this composition. He immediately begins to draw from that. And he says, the minute I saw this painting, I began to make drawings about it. But th the first minute I did these drawings, something else, something completely different came out of that. You have this one, 
this uh, painting in 1930, and you have, sorry, the drawings, here is the one I wanted, in 1932, that comes another thing, the incredible expression, tension um, of the body that he analyzes to the end, changing the shapes, making only the relations of black and white of the forces which are inside the composition in different ways, with color and without color. And these kind of paintings, which are already in 1932, leave or lead towards the big painting, which is a kind of reassume of this tendency, which is the Guernica. I'm showing a photograph of Guernica to the place in which he meant it to be. It was the Spanish pavilion um, in, in the international fair. 1937 in Paris. Um, many things have been sent, uh, said about this composition, many sources, all of them. I mean, you are going to have here the incredible pleasure of uh, having Professor Robert Rosenblum, who has written possibly one of, of the best articles on uh, Guernica and all the influences that uh, the painting had. So you can ask him about the painting personally. Um, but in this painting, which obviously comes from the Grüneval altarpiece, in which Goya also is using a painting that we are going to see next uh, in, the, in the next slides, which is the 3rd of May of Goya, uh, to get the intensity of, um, for example, the figure on the right with the raised arms in the shape of a V. We, Picasso explicitly refers to that in relation to the Goya painting. But we also have the bull on the right as part of the series that he did beforehand of the bullfight using the bulls and the horses. And you have the horse in the center. In this composition, there are a few things, I mean, apart from the main composition and the, in, and the use of things from all sources, but I was very interested on some of the most dramatic and expressionistic, so to speak, um, aspects of the preparatory drawings and the figures in the painting. For example, I didn't know where this head of the horse came from, because that's unusual in painting. It doesn't exist so easily. I mean, this incredible elongation of the, of the neck of the horse and the mouth open and the tongue coming as a kind of sword out of the mouth. I was interested in the tears and the mouths of the many drawings and studies that he did for this composition. And I think, I mean, when I did this uh, study years ago, and I went to the drawings rela or compositions relating to this one, for example, this horse <coughs> here, which is obviously for a bullfight because the horse is um, well, uh, hurt. <coughs> or the death of the in the 30s. And you have the <coughs> Crivelli and Cosmetura representations of, uh, uh, of uh, St. George in which the horse have this elongation and torsion of the head and the mouth opened where the tongue comes like a sword outside. Here you also have the horse on, you know, um, the horses with a and on a levé with uh, the figure of the of the dragon underneath in a very s similar way as the horse of Picasso over the figures. And here you have this head of the studies, but also you see the heads of Crivelli and look at the way the mouths open. The tongue comes out of this very big, very marked teeth and the tears coming down the eyes in a way that he was interested 
interested in the studies that he did. I only show in an, one in the studies that he did for Gernika. So he comes, gets uh, steals from everywhere in order to create the, or, or give the maximum of expression. Here we have the, the 3rd of May by Goya in which uh, the arms are raised in this uh, shape of V that Picasso says is the shape of victory long before it was used by Churchill or later on uh, by other, other people, but is used already here in Picasso and is the V of victory of the innocents as in this composition. Of course, he was using this idea for a commission painting, but that's not the same, because in commissions, when he had to paint under commission that he did very few times in his life, Picasso is a little bit more, um, it's not so natural, is more intellectual. You can see the copy, you can see that he comes directly out of the painter, like in this massacre of Korea, which is obviously taken from the painting by, <coughs> by um, uh, Goya. We have now, this, is, this was the war and the after war, and in the period that goes from after the Second World War to the end of his life, uh, Picasso uh, goes back again to the old masters. It's a period in which, as he said, in front of Manet de Jeuner sur l'Herbe, let's, the let's <coughs> leave the pain for another occasion. So to say, let's take the pleasures of life now, because the pain will come later on. And we can see that it is the period in which he goes around again the themes or the subjects of women in relation to the women which are around him at the end of his life, the themes of love and sex, the themes of, of, of his atelier, which is important, and he says that comes from the space of Las Meninas, and these are going to be the last series of paintings in his own life. Before that, in 1950, we have like the first idea of this coming back to the world of women in his reinterpretations of a painting by Courbet, the women at the border of the <coughs> River Seine, which is in Paris in the Petit Palais. It's a subject of the two women together, which in Courbet has nothing strange about it, uh, but in Picasso, as many times in his, especially in his early uh, uh, works, is mixed together with the subject of women relationship towards the very end, so lesbian relations, like is it young ladies on the banks of the Seine in 1950, here in which the Courbet women are really getting together, entangled, the two of them. But if he goes again to the Delacroix Femme d'Alger. This is the step before the Femme d'Alger, which came next in his life in the 55, in the 54, 55 years, in which he wants to mix the, the two compositions of Delacroix about the women of Alger. Delacroix, as he used to say, or he, Picasso had already said, Delacroix as he said, was the father of all of us, the, 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 the modern painters. And he is, he's using many things of Delacroix, but in this period of the end of the life is again the world of women, of entangled women, intimacy of women in which he is interested, using especially Jacqueline, who was the wife, or his wife, his second wife, for this series of compositions that he mixes, he changes in different ideas, dating them as he always did, so we know exactly how quickly he changed, how unstable or unstable he was, you know, like in his own life with his paintings. 
and I just yes, pass in a few compositions because I think we have to go towards the end of the lecture. But we see how he changes from one to the other, always this world of women, in this case naked, to this incredible homage to the femme d'Alger, which is this portrait of Jacqueline in Turkish costume that probably you have already seen here. From the femme d'Alger, she moves to Las Meninas, but I just making a kind of free decision and going first of all to Manet, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, uh, the main composition that he had already used in the very early uh, 20th century when he is still in Barcelona for the portrait of a family there, but then he really understands this painting or gets obsessed and interested with this painting only in the 1960s when he does the variations on the subject of uh, the Déjeuner sur l'herbe, which goes back also to his uh, obsession with the idea of the artist and his model, because he, there is a kind of mixture of the two things. One very important figure is the one at the back. You saw in the Manet painting, at the back, the woman which is leaning and is taking something from the floor, from the, from the earth. And that is always a very important figure in all these compositions of uh, a Picasso. You can see that it gets even protagonism of its own in, all, in some of them, like in this one. You can see very clearly that the idea of the painter and the model is also here. And you see how the Manet painting evolves and changes and is not anymore Manet, it's Picasso himself. He said that uh, from Delacroix and the Femme d'Alger. He said, Delacroix in the Femme, in the Femme d'Alger, in the Women of Alger, was taking his inspiration from Rubens. It's nothing bad if I take my inspiration from him. So, with his sense of humor, I think that's uh, quite interesting too. And you see this last abstraction of the subject, and then he does again, or furthermore, a series of paintings and drawings only on the subject of the woman, woman in the back, like in here, the woman uh, leaning down and picking up flowers, uh, what he does. And this beautiful uh, Déjeuner sur l'herbe ends up with a sculpture, which is now in Estocolm, in the Museum of Modern Art, in which the real figures go sort of in life in the garden of the museum. The last homage is to Las Meninas, the painting that we saw he was interested in from his early life in Madrid, in the, in the, in the, in the drawings in the Prado Museum, and that they are the core of a series of studies in the 50s, in 57 and onwards. All these paintings and sketches, I don't know if there is any outside, but they're all in Barcelona, in the Museo Picasso. And there you can see how he goes. I mean, he doesn't have any, any respect, I would say that word, any respect for a style or a uh, style. Uh, that's the word. So he moves from... Um, very kind of 19th century copies of the Meninas to something that goes through the, his ideas of the synthetic cubism. They're all of the same period in 57, but he mixes and he uses all he has done in life in order to recreate this work. He said of Las Meninas, when I was painting these uh, Meninas, I had the um, the instinct or the, the passion for moving the things, the, the things and the figures around to my own pleasure. I didn't have to follow what Velázquez did. I began to do what Velázquez did, but then later on I began to move them around and change them in position from here to, from right to left, from left to right, until the painting was mine. You have another head 
which is particularly, particularly beautiful in style, expression, and technique. Because Picasso, and that I haven't said before, paints with the strokes, the brush strokes, the handle of the line, the handle of the paint, of the real painters of all times. There is no difference in that. You can see here the, the security, the intensity, the expressivity of his lines and brush strokes. With the space, he does what I told you. When he is in front of that, he mixes the ideas of his own atelier, and, and he, as he said, with the ideas of Las Meninas, moving paintings, figures from one place to the other, and always having as the, as the main central focus of his painting the little figure on the back, the man on the steps, towards the light of the door, which I find very moving and incredibly interesting, because it is in fact for not everybody, for, but for real connoisseurs of, paint, of painting, the most important pa mm, uh, figure in the painting. I'm going to show you one thing of the Meninas. Here, well, you went a little bit. I'm sorry about this. I don't know if it is possible. Uh, see if it is stopped here. Yeah. I don't know if you will be able to, yeah, it is possible to see it even in the reproduction, but, well, okay, it just goes back to what it was, but I want to show you this, and I will go to the, to the place. Look at the man in the back on the stairs, and his black figure is against this beautiful white light. In there is, it's not easy to see it in the reproduction. You will have to go to the Prado to see it in painting. But there is one, only one brush stroke by Velázquez that holds the whole light. And it's easy to see. Even in the reproduction, he did that probably at the very end of the painting, and it holds everything up. And when in the Prado we were cleaning the painting with a um, really fantastic restorer, John Brilly, he left that part of the composition to the very end because it really holds the whole composition. So it is interesting that Picasso, as a great artist, really understanding the paintings of the past, has always the little figure there as the central core. If you take that away, you destroy the whole composition, and he never does. It's always there. Hmm? It's the main thing. So he is, uh, you know, he is a fantastic uh, interpreter of the past. He shows us things. And this is the last one. At the very end of his life, when he was about to die, he did a series of self-portraits that were at the very end of his life, in which the fear, the old age, but not just that, the fear of death is very evident, especially in this one, which I wanted to use, and in which we see this early ideas on Greco in El Prado, when he said, and El Greco, especially the heads. He said also, I liked these nights with the pointed beards of El Greco and the intensity of the eyes. And I think, I think that at the end of his life, when he was painting these last self portraits, he was coming back to his first love for all masters, who was El Greco and the novelty of El Greco. Look at the eyes, only the eyes of this portrait, not just the beard, which is more, uh, is more related to that, but just the eyes, one different to the other, and all the two of them, crazy, tells you that he was thinking of El Greco. And that's it. Thank you. No, if you have questions or. Sorunuz var mı? Harikulade. 
bildiri için nasıl teşekkür etsin? Uh, we don't know how to thank you enough for this wonderful lecture. We would like to thank the distinguished expert for this wonderful journey through the history. If she have any questions, she will be answering your questions. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Is yeah? Okay. Thank you very much for this lecture. And there was one thing that attracted my attention. You, uh, when Picasso was inspired by the old masters, how about the Renaissance works of the 16th and 17th centuries? Is there a reason for not seeing these works in his experience? Well, he, there are, there are, um, uh, dialogues with Picasso about about the old masters yeah, I have to. there are uh, words of Picasso about the painters of the Renaissance and he always says that he's not interested in the Renaissance painters he says I know that I draw like Raphael or even better but I'm not interested in Raphael. Uh, but he is contradictory when he speaks about the old masters, because, for example, he likes uh, Piero della Francesca in Arezzo, in, in, the, in Arezzo. I show you that he probably looked at uh, Cosimo Tura and Crivelli uh, for the Guernica, in this exp expressivity which is from the north of Italy. He rejects, for example, Tintoretto. He says it's all decorations, it's like a film, it's not interesting. Um, he uses Michelangelo, I think. In Michelangelo, there is a difference. Uh, we know from Cotto that when they were both in Italy, in 1917 with the uh, uh, Russian ballets of Diaghilev. They went around, they saw things, they saw the um, Pompeian frescoes, and he went to the Sixteen Chapel, and he was admiring that fresco, to which it refers later on Gutuso. In 1949, I think, he says, I was with Picasso there, and he said, Picasso said, look at the colors look at the blue and the ochres. He didn't speak about the beauty of the figures, but he spoke about this incredible contrast of the last judgment of Michelangelo. Then there is also another quotation about Michelangelo when he was looking in a book of reproductions of the ceiling of the Sixteenth Chapel, and he says, and he passed his finger on the profile of one of the figures, one of the nudie, he nudie, one of the naked boys and he went down from the top bottom of his body to the top and to the ear and passing his finger his, this finger <laughs> it went up 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 and saying how beautiful so he really admired and I think that kind of um, single figure single interest the contrast of the the ochres and the and the and the blues hmm? or some of the contours when he draws his figures are coming from these painters, though he says, or we don't see these paintings so obvious in his works. I think that in a painting that I show you, let's see if I can find it. Um, I think I just went out of the, it's impossible, but in the flutes of Pan, this, um, contrast between between the naked figures in kind of uh, pink and the blue of the sky and the sea is, a, in my opinion, a reflection of the Sixteen Chapel. I'm going to try, if you want, to find the number of the slide in which um, this were. 63, my goodness, I never thought I was going to have so many slides, 63. Oh, wait a second, because I'm getting there. I'm sorry that you are with me. 63. 
here we are. Yeah, this one here. And let's go to the big slideshow. Hmm. In this one here, the ochres, the naked um, uh, boys, when you see the final judgment of Michelangelo, it's so evident. And the contrast of the pure blue on the back is a reflection of the Renaissance painters. I, I don't know, but it is something that he rejects in his words and he rejects in his paintings. He's more interested in Grunewald, in Cranach, in Aldorfer, uh, the Renaissance of the North, of Germany, you know, than in the Renaissance of the South. And the only ones I got is this Crivelli and Cosmetura, which are very similar to the Renaissance in the North, in the expressivity of the figures. I don't know if this can be an answer to your question, but I think there are so many things to study in Picasso. Mm -hmm. I think that Manuela, you gave us such wonderful information. There is not a necessity to ask you more. We are really impressed. It's okay. I love art. Thank you.